Hello, I'm Matthew Wagner, and I'd like to introduce you to one of the videos that forms part of the video series that was taken from a series of podcasts that I produced a while ago, audio podcasts, which I've taken and I've converted them to a series of videos and enhanced them. So I do hope that you enjoy the video. Hi there, it's Matthew Wagner, and thank you again for joining me. If you are joining me again, and if this is your first time listening to my podcast, I thank you for joining me. Today I'm talking about uh, whether or not there's any sort of connection between anxiety and, and blood sugar, and I think I've got some interesting information to share with you. Over the years, you see, neurologists and others studying the brain have learned about uh, an abundance of very interesting and informative characteristics of the brain. And uh, this has all been made possible because of advanced brain scans. Or I shouldn't say all been made possible, but certainly it's been enhanced dramatically through advanced uh, brain scans. These scans have not only provided information on various brain systems and functions, and information on resulting problems, say when there's a, one of these systems doesn't function properly, but these scans have allowed an abundance of helpful suggestions to emerge as to how to go about optimizing functioning of various areas of the brain. Best of all, there are really good implications for anxiety and panic attack sufferers. One such implication concerns the basal ganglia system of the brain, and really blood sugar levels, carbohydrates, and anxiety. First though, I want to talk about what the basal ganglia system is. This system is an area of the brain that is responsible for many processes such as fear, anxiety, panic attacks, and other things. What's really great though is that by optimizing the functioning of the basal ganglia, things such as fear and anxiety can be decreased while at the same time things such as motivation and energy levels can be increased. So how do you go about optimizing the basal ganglia system? Obvious question then. Well, in principle this can be done by keeping blood sugar levels consistent throughout the day. And the fortunate thing here is that, that this can be done by well, first of all, by eating more frequently throughout the day. I'm not saying eating more overall, I'm saying eating more frequently throughout the day. For example, eating five times a day in smaller quantities instead of three large meals, you will help to stabilize your blood sugar levels. I want to make a little example here. If you ever watched animals, for example, horses sit there and eat, you'll notice that they graze throughout the day as opposed to eating several big meals like we humans are inclined to do. This grazing helps keep, really helps keep the blood sugar level stable. That's what I'm trying to say. But there's another factor at play here. It's important what you eat. Specifically, it's important what your hunger... First of all, it's important because your hunger needs to be satisfied throughout the day. And that's done by utilizing food that actually lasts longer in the body. Food that lasts longer typically doesn't cause as much of a jump in blood sugar levels. Remember how important it is to keep blood sugar levels as consistent as possible throughout the day. So in my opinion, a healthy diet is one that is A, lower in carbohydrates than, than the typical Western diet, particularly low in what are called, um, car in what are called carbohydrates with a high glycemic load. So um, you want to consume less carbohydrates that actually have a high glycemic load. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But there's sort of an a, a part A, B, and C to this. So first of all, lower in carbohydrates. B, lower in sugar. C, consume more frequently throughout the day in lesser quantities. And I should just make a correction. I'm not saying just lower in carbohydrates, but I'm saying specifically carbohydrates with a high glycemic load. So I want to talk about what the glycemic load refers to. And to do so, I'll have to first explain what's called the glycemic index and what that means. The glycemic index is a system that ranks carbohydrates according to their effect on blood sugar. The more dramatic your blood sugar response, the more insulin your body needs to produce in order to bring down your sugar levels. I just want to carry on and, and tell you what glycemic load means. And what that does is it takes into account both a carbohydrate's glycemic index, which I just mentioned, as well as how many carbohydrates are contained in a typical portion. So it's a better predictor of how high your blood sugar is re, is raised because it's a more realistic it's a more realistic thing because if you if you know 
it's great to know how quickly your blood sugar gets raised, but it's also important to to know you know how many carbohydrates you'd actually need to consume in order to raise your blood sugar that high. So a carbohydrate with a high glycemic load will produce a greater spike in energy, or I should say blood sugar, because of a more dramatic blood sugar response. However, this spike is followed by a more dramatic drop in sugar, referred to as a crash. This crash makes you feel lethargic and hungrier. Obviously, given what has been discussed above regarding the basal ganglia system, this crash is not desired. That's why eating a diet that consists of carbohydrates with a lower glycemic load, in my opinion, is best for anxiety, panic attacks, weight loss, and I would say probably overall wellness. Now, I'm not suggesting that this dietary approach in itself is a magic potion for anxiety and panic attacks, but I'm saying it's a great adjunct to the many other things that have been discussed in the newsletter. There are many great tasting sources of carbohydrates that are lower in glycemic load, and uh, many great sources of protein and healthy fats, vegetarian, meat, fish, dairy, vegetables, nuts, protein powders, etc. And um, I think if you explore this option a little more, you can... You can find diets, planned diets, that follow these, um, these principles more closely. So I thank you again for joining me for this podcast, and I hope you'll join me again. For more information on panic attack recovery, recovery from agoraphobia and anxiety, please visit my website at panicattackrecovery.com and sign up for my free and continuous newsletter. Thank you. Material in this newsletter is provided for educational and informational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for a psychologist, psychiatrist, or other health care provider's consultation. Please consult a psychologist, psychiatrist, or appropriate health care provider about the applicability of any opinions or recommendations with respect to your own panic attacks, anxiety, and agoraphobia, or any other symptom or condition.